Hi. Good morning, everybody. I, I just have a couple minutes at the outset, and I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart that are teachers for teaching. I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for supporting those people that are here that are teaching, and for all of you caring about the next generation of Americans. I am the first school superintendent in the history of America to run for president of the United States. I, I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. It's 95,000 kids, mostly kids. Denver Public Schools, yeah. Uh, all, mostly kids of color, mostly kids uh, living in poverty. I was very proud to have the chance to do that before I was in the Senate. And every single thing I do in the Senate uh, runs through the lens of the kids that I used to work for in Denver. In fact, I think that if our preschool kids actually voted, we'd have a much more rational agenda that we were pursuing than the one that we're pursuing today. And that's why I'm in this race. If we don't change what we're doing, we're going to be the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity, not more, to the people coming after us. That is why I am the only candidate in this race with a plan to end poverty in America in a generation. In my first year as president, Together, we can cut the childhood poverty rate in the United States by nearly 40 percent. Just by passing my American Family Act, it would give a massive tax cut to the middle class, many of them teachers in this country, and support the poorest students in America. Because what I took away from being superintendent of the Denver Public Schools is that the schools can't fix it by themselves. We have to end poverty in this country. We have to give kids a place to live, a meal to eat, and then they can learn in the schools where all of you work. I'm Michael Bennett, and that's why I'm running for president. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for teaching. I really appreciate it. Hi. You're very good, right on time. It's nice, to, always on time. <laughs> Morning, Senator. We can't, when we're in schools, we can't show up late. You got to be on time. Exactly. We, uh, we had the good fortune. I, I ran into Senator Bennett last night going into the hotel. I ran into him this morning quite early. Or he, he, he started out for this room earlier than I did. So your punctuality is important. But you, you mentioned that you were the first school superintendent to run for president of the United States. When you were the school superintendent in Denver, what was your view of what you wanted the federal government to do? What role the federal government should have? Because now you're going to be looking at this from a different lens if you are President Bennett. Well, in when, I, when I was the superintendent, I spent a lot of time wondering why everybody in Washington was so mean to our kids and to our teachers. That's what I wondered. And then when I went back to Washington, I discovered they're not mean. It's just the farthest place in the universe. I don't mean this metaphorically. I mean literally the farthest place in the universe from our schools and our classrooms is the United States Senate and those marble hallways. And people think they know what's going on in schools because they might have attended one like 150 years ago, <laughs> but they don't actually have any idea what's happening there. And so what I was expecting out of the federal government was that they would help us deliver for the kids in Denver. So, and what that meant to me was, you know, fully funding our special ed budget, which they never did, fully funding Title I in a way that got the money to the poorest kids in our district, which they really never did. Uh, as somebody said on the earlier panel, I don't think the job of the education secretary is to be the superintendent of America's schools. I think what we need to do is figure out how to support our kids and our teachers as we transition to a set of 21st century schools. Our, our schools were designed hundreds of years ago, and it is unfair to expect that we're gonna be able to succeed in the 21st century if we don't reimagine what that looks like. Under me, what, a, what, a, what an education secretary would do would be help to help transmit that innovation across the country where kids living in poverty are actually overcoming circumstances because of phenomenal teaching and phenomenal school leadership the rest of the country needs to see those examples because we're desperate for them all over. You talk about phenomenal teaching, Senator, and one of the things that this nation does is try to figure out how do we hold these extraordinary teachers 
accountable? How do we judge them? When you were in the position, you instituted a merit pay system. It led to a strike. Teachers thought it was not something that they could adhere to, in part because it meant that they couldn't depend on what their salary was going to be. They went on strike about it. What did you learn from that reaction to that merit pay? Well, in fairness to me, the strike didn't happen until 15 years after I put the system in place. And it was a system that- But you that did put it in place. With, negotiated with the teachers union, yes. We, we, and we together went to the citizens of Denver and raised $25 million a year indexed to inflation to pay for that new system. And but to the, your point, so many people thought it would be a good idea. And a lot beginning. of people thought it was a good idea for a long time because we were able to pay teachers far more than we otherwise would be able to pay teachers. We paid teachers that were serving in, a, in high poverty schools more than teachers in more affluent schools. We paid teachers that, that brought a special set of skills like teaching English language acquisition that was in very short supply. Correct, and that was part of the intent of instituting it. But then it went sour, if you will. Did you well, learn anything from that? Well, what I learned, well, first of all, what happened in Denver was when I was superintendent, we went from being sixth in the metro area in teacher salaries to being number one. And what, I, what, I, what, and what has happened in Denver is when I was there, it was very common that you could meet teachers who could afford to live in Denver. And today, no teachers can afford to live in Denver. Ten years later, you can't afford to live there. And that's what led to the strike. And as part of what happened, that pay system um, uh, also went out the window. And I accept that and agree with that. What, what I believe is that our entire system of compensating teachers belongs to a labor market. It came from a labor market where we were discriminating against women and we were saying to women, you have two choices. One's being a teacher and one's being a nurse. So if you don't want to be a nurse, how about coming and teaching Julius Caesar every year for 30 years of your life? And if you stick with us for 30 years, we'll give you a pension that you know, sounded pretty good because your spouse was probably going to die before you. That's the system we've all inherited. And it made sense when we had a labor market that discriminated against women. It doesn't make sense today. We have to massively increase what we pay teachers in this country. That's what I've learned. They have to be paid, they have to be paid on a scale that looks like the other professionals in their community. And I'm talking about lawyers and doctors and real estate agents. This is the hardest job that anybody can do. Are you so, suggesting as president that you would, you would say that the federal government needs to get involved in making certain teachers do get equitable pay? Well, what can the federal government well, do? Well, I think it's really important. What we should not do is make empty promises, which I some agree. candidates do. And I don't make empty promises. 9% of the money that we're spending on K-12 education comes from the federal government. 91% comes from state and local governments. You can layer in a little bit on teacher pay if you want, but that'll be here today, gone tomorrow. America has to make this commitment to our teachers, is there all of it. Is there every local school board, every state, and the federal government together needs to say, we are gonna pay our teachers what they're worth instead of discriminating against them, which is what we're doing today. And is there anything that you as president could do to provide incentive for the local city and state governments to do exactly what you just Yeah, said. there is, there is. I mean, to drag our systems into the 21st century, we can use federal money to incentivize that kind of innovation. We can use the federal government to provide matching funds. We can triple, and the other candidates will come tell you this, and I'll say it too, triple the Title I budget and triple the IDA budget, and still we are gonna have to confront as Americans the fact that we are paying our teachers as if we live in, a, in an, an economy that's discriminated against women, and it's gonna take every single jurisdiction in this country, starting with my old school district, to decide that we're gonna pay teachers what they're worth, and that's what we're gonna have to do. And as president, I would convene all 50 governors and all the mayors and all the superintendents and say, we can't pay our teachers like we're living in the 19th century anymore. We got to pay them like we're in the 21st century and we're all going to have to find a way to jump together. So one of the issues we have, uh, the Wall Street Journal has done an analysis about this that says that within three years, America's manufacturers, not the American economy as a whole, America's manufacturers will hire more college grads than they will hire 
high school grad. So when you talk about things that are based in an older time, that is one of them. The understanding that a high school education qualified you to work in manufacturing. Both of those things are not true. Uh, the high school diploma doesn't qualify you for it, and the jobs in manufacturing are not what they used to be. How do we think about this? How do we think about equipping America's high school graduates so that they can earn a living wage, or is that too an old-fashioned? No, that's how, what we should be thinking about. Remember I said earlier, I wish our preschool kids voted not, you know, <laughs> because then that would be our agenda. If you go out <laughs> to America and you ask America, uh, what is the Democratic Party's education agenda? You know what you get back from the focus groups? Free college. I can tell you what the kids in Denver and their parents are much more interested in. They're a hell of a lot more interested in free preschool than they are in free college. And they are a lot more interested in knowing the answer to your question, which is what are we going to do for the 70% of kids in this country that graduate from high school and don't go to college to make sure when they graduate from high school they can earn a living wage, not the minimum wage. There is no reason. We can do that in America, and that should be our agenda. In fact, it is my agenda. I have proposed spending $50 billion of the federal government to set up, to establish um, uh, uh, relationships among community colleges, high schools, businesses going back to the sixth grade in America, so middle school, so that kids know what they're going to need to be able to do by the time they graduate from high school to earn that living wage. No kid should graduate from high school in America without one year of community college under their belt and without the ability to earn a living wage. That's what a 21st century high school is going to look like. That's what we have to do. And by the way, at the same time, we got to make it easier for people to go to college as well. And that's not about free college in my mind. That's about making sure the cost of college is reduced in the United States of America. It has become a terrible barrier, and it's one of the reasons why, unfortunately, the best predictor of the quality of your education today in America is your parents' income, which is an outrage. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Universal preschool will help change that. The 70% of kids graduating and being able to work in manufacturing or other jobs. Today in Denver, there are kids all over the district who are going to school three days a week. They're going to an employer two days a week. They're getting paid while they're there. And then when they graduate from high school, they're, they're employed in a job that pays a living wage. We can do that all across the country. It would transform the lives of millions of Americans. And I think it would transform the American economy. One of the things you talked about in terms of what will determine how a kid does in, um, in their education is the education of their parents. Another thing that determines it is where they live. Exactly. Codes, including rural districts. So many places you talk about that three-day school uh, week. Some are in Colorado in a four-day school Terrible. week in part because of money, right? So they have extended hours so that they can pay for the four days. Do you think that this is something that really is a benefit to children? in rural districts, and is this something as president that you would? It, I think it's terrible, and, and I'll say this, I'm running for president, I don't want to be accused of saying one thing in one place and something somewhere else. I think kids should have to go to school six days a week if we're left up to me, and I certainly don't think they should have to go four days a week. And I, and I believe our school calendar is too short. We need, 181 days is not enough if you're living in poverty in this country. And so I'm not going to mandate that from Washington, D.C. And those of you that, you know, uh, let me tell my kids, I'm not forcing you guys to go six <laughs> days a week earlier. But it is a disgrace that what we're doing. I was in this place called the Corridor of Shame with my wife, Susan, in North Carolina. It's rural North Carolina over the Ju July 4th weekend. And I met with a group of people down there that 70 years ago, brought a desegregation lawsuit that was filed before Brown versus Board of Education was filed. It became part of that lawsuit. And people had to move away because their families' houses were burned down because they were involved in the lawsuit because they weren't welcome in the community anymore. And there were two people there. This is a rural district. There were two people there that were in their late 70s, two women who were the ch daughters of the people who filed some of these lawsuits. And they'd come to my meeting because they wanted to tell me that the state legislature in South Carolina doesn't care about the kids living in that community today any more than they did 70 years ago. 
They wanted to tell me that the schools are more segregated today than they were 70 years ago and worse today than they were 70 years ago. And, and, and I asked them, what do you, what's your lesson learned from all of this? And they said, we have to vote those people out of office. And we have to vote people in office that actually care about kids living in rural school districts across America, especially if they're African American, and especially if they're poor. You know, it is the reason why the, where you live and the zip code you're in defines the education, as you were saying, is that that's what your parents live where they can afford to live. And when you, when you, when, when you can afford to buy a million dollar house, your problem is solved. For everybody else in America, your chances of getting into college if you're poor are roughly nine in a hundred. We, we're we're going to go to the audience, but one of the things you mentioned in terms of if you can afford that million dollar house, your problems are solved as far as education because our funding for education in large part is based on real estate. Right. Right? right. Do you think that needs to change? I do. I, and I've pro I'm the only candidate who's actually proposed that we ought to use some federal money to work with local communities that want to resolve this tension in our democracy because that's what it is. This isn't just about schools. It's about what kind of country we want to be to try to figure out how to, how to bring communities together again. We had one of our debates in Detroit. The children in Detroit are marooned. And they're marooned because at some point the Supreme Court said, well, if you got to you go across jurisdictions to desegregate schools, the Constitution doesn't compel that. Well, that just means that today the schools in Detroit are more segregated than they have ever been. And th that's what we got we to gotta address as a country. Let's go to the audience for a question. We'll start with you. Please tell us who you are and your question, please. Hi, my name is Maria Harmon. I came from New Orleans, Louisiana. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm part of a grassroots organization called Step Up Louisiana, and we're a proud member of the Journey for Justice Alliance. In New Orleans, uh, we are the only city in this country that is 100% all charter school district. There are no more neighborhood-based schools. According to the Washington Post, up to $1 billion in federal funds were wasted on charter schools that never opened or opened and then closed because of mismanagement and other reasons. All charter schools may not be bad, but for many of us, they seem like they're targeting black and brown neighborhoods and then not delivering on the promise of educating our kids equitably. What kind of accountability mechanisms should be in place for charter schools? Thank you very much for that question. That, 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 that is a great question. So in the Denver Public Schools, my district that I mentioned earlier, which is 95,000 kids or so, we do have charter schools. We don't have any private charter schools, but we have public charter schools. And the school board is the authorizer of the charter schools and the non-charter schools. No one else can authorize a charter school in Denver except for the school board. And in Denver, the charter schools have to, have to, are held accountable to the same school performance framework that applies to every single school in the district. And that school performance framework is largely based on student growth. All over America, we have these idiotic accountability systems that's comparing this year's fourth graders to last year's fourth graders. That's totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant to the fourth graders and totally irrelevant to the teachers that are, that are having to teach kids. It's ridiculous. Our system doesn't do that. It's based on growth. And our charter schools are held to the same standards as everybody else. And our charter schools are required to have the same percentage of, of special needs kids and English language learner kids and, and kids living in poverty. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a heck of a lot more perfect than what almost any other school district in America has done, particularly Detroit, where Betsy DeVos did her worst work of all and where you literally literally have no accountability at all. None. And that will <coughs> only result in failure as it has all over Detroit and the state of Michigan. And uh, I invite you to come to Colorado to see what we've done there. And uh, I don't think charters are the be all or end all at all. We're never going to scale success for most kids through charter schools. But in my context, uh, they've been a useful 
uh, element of it, but only because of the accountability system that you're talking about. Without that, it would have been a complete, complete disaster. Senator, thank you for your answer, and thank you thank for your you. question. Another question over here. Grand Risings. <laughs> My name is Tanisha Grant. I am a proud member of the Coalition for Educational Justice and the Alliance for Quality Education, and under the uh, and we are under J for J. We are under the coalition with J for J. Um, as a parent with three grand, with three children and a grandmother of one very special grandson who happens to be autistic, I'm from New York City. After 10 years, only 13% of black and brown children graduated college ready. I'm one of the parents who helped organize to win more than 100 community schools in our city. You, thank you. Using an evidence-based school improvement strategy that focuses on the community school model. What will you do to fully fund sustainable community schools that have culturally responsive curriculum so black mothers like me do not have to fight for equity in education for all students. Thank you, thank you. So, so let, me, let me say first of all, thank you for fighting ec for equity for all of our students. That's what we need, that's what we have to do. You know, the system we have today, when you got one group of kids who through no fault of their own have no access to preschool and another group has access to preschool, equals not equal. And when you got one group who through no fault of their own have terrible K-12 schools and another because of where their parents live have good schools, equals not equal. And when one group of kids, and this is happening every day of every hour of every day and every week, one group of kids has college counselors and after school sports and summer jobs and the other group of kids has nothing. Equal is not equal and equal is not equal. And yet we live in a country where more money goes to the wealthy kids than it does to the poor kids in the United States of America. If you want to close the achievement gap, we have to do the opposite of that. And I'm the only politician in this race that's saying that. And I've seen it firsthand. I would support the uh, community schools that you're talking about, I'm well aware of the ones that you're talking about in New York, and I'll go one step further. I think the Department of Human Services, the Department of Housing, the Department of Labor should all be brought together by a President of the United States to support the work that we're trying to do at the local level with these community schools. We have to solve these issues together, and we can wrap these services around our schools. You know, a lot of our kids don't have access to dental health. They probably do in your community schools. They do in a lot of them. They don't have access to health care. They don't have, they, they, they're getting evicted from housing. There are all these issues that the community school model is meant to set up to address together. And I think we should have a federal government where the agencies are all aligned in trying to support the objectives that you have. That's what we should do. There is, no com there is no department of children in America, but if I'm elected president, the whole federal government is gonna act like a department of children because how we treat the next generation is how we're gonna be judged in this country. It's how we should be judged in this country, which is why your work is so important. And a final question from- Oh, I'm excuse, my, excuse me. My name, oh, my name is Irene Robinson and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a proud member of the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, and I'm also a proud member of Journey for Justice. Um, today, several cities across the country are facing state takeover or closure of their local school system, including Little Rock in Houston. In Chicago in 2015, Myself and 11 other parents, community leaders, and teachers had to go on a 34-day hunger strike 
to save our last open enrollment neighborhood high school. What we, what we, what, wait, what we, what will you do? This is what we want to know. What will you do to protect the rights of local communities to preserve their school rather than face closing and in, in, inequity forced on us by school privatizing? We would like to know what would you do? Thank you. Government? First of all, I don't think. It's a great question. There's so much in that question. First of all, I don't think there should be any school privatizers in school at all. So that's one thing I'd say. Second, I have never seen a state takeover of a school district that's worked well in America, and they don't work well, and we shouldn't do it. And third, we have got to come together as Americans, and every single question today revolved around this, and this is, the, this is the, in my mind, the fundamental issue. We have got to come around together to make sure we are fulfilling the civil rights obligations of our schools. And that is what I, there is no reason for the federal government to be involved in schools other than to support that civil rights impulse. And if, I, if you elect me president, I will support that all day long, every single day. There is so much we have to do as Americans. Education used to be the wind beneath our wings in this country. And it can be again. If we listen to what our families want and what our kids want and we enact those policies, we're going to be able to do it again. Thank you for having me today. Thank Senator you. Michael Bennett, thank you Appreciate for starting it. us off today. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. your excellent questions out there. Uh, your next thank candidate, you. Mayor Pete Buttigieg, will be out in just a moment. Thank a big you. round of applause for Senator thank Michael you, Bennett everybody. of Colorado. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Great, Senator. Much following you. Welcome.